<laughs> it didn't end up like that. And the final part of the question was, do you share any characteristics or do you relate to your character in any way, that politically correct person that you've been describing? I just think so, I look like him. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think the thing about Gene, one of the reasons why he became such a, well, quite an iconic figure was in many respects, he was a, sort of a voice for the people. I mean, you know, at the time when we were doing Life on Mars and in Ashes, we'd have this, this bunch of arses called New Labour in. And, um, and I think people kind of were incredibly despondent with politicians, etc. And so he became a sort of voice of the anti all that you get it really. And I think that's why he was so popular. Okay. And my acting, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And, and your character? Uh, I'm Floyd Raymond Hill. And, uh, <laughs> thank you both. <laughs> Great <laughs> I'm the mother. Yeah, uh, I think he was just described as a misogynist bastard. <laughs> By him, yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, he was he was just he was kind of the brawn rather than the brain, I think, and uh, he just wanted to be Gene and the side The man love, I think, to be out of the mother to be yeah, no, I'm hoping I haven't got any of his traits. I'm hoping. You truly were acting. I'm hoping. I'm going to call it that. <laughs> no, I don't really think I'm like him. I'm surrounded by too many girls, uh, daughters, and things. And people uh, around me to be like him. Couldn't get away from you. I don't think so. I'm going to get one or two of them. Fantastic. Never a nice ending. <laughs> well, what was it like for you ladies 
reasons especially that, you know, these, these guys are being given permission to act as sexist and all the rest of it. Did they sort of take that out over into sort of lunch breaks and they oh, tried? <laughs> um, we had to fight a long time. <laughs> so it was confidence that we changed. Give me the microphone. <laughs> um, yeah, no, no, they didn't. They were very well And then obviously you're, you're, you're acting back in time. Did you have to sort of research, you know, that to any extent, or was it all been written into the script for you? you know, was it, did you to get into a role? Did you have to take yourself back and find we, out we of that time? Well, we got different aftershaves. My um, girls got perfumes from the 80s, so we packed the band up. Well, I, actually, I was still on Brew in the 70s. And this, and this, uh, that's what John and I did for research. He wore old spice and I wore Brew. <laughs> and he watched a box set in Sweden, and I watched a box set in Manchester Day. So, so. And that's how you go tough, oh, oh, tough. <laughs> Great to hear, it, it was such a successful series. Um, what's it feel like as actors to be part of something that, you know, is so popular with, with everybody and, you know, it always catapulted you in some ways to fame for that particular character as well as everything else you've done. How does it feel uh, being part of something like that? Anybody to answer? I suppose it has changed everybody's life and, uh, you know, it's nice to that people are really interested in the show. We love doing it. It's just one of those shows that comes along in your career that, you know, catches the imagination of everybody. I think it helped with the years a lot of times and the cars and the clothes and the music and the, the scripts and the acting and the whole production of it all. We're just planning together to have a great recipe for a great TV show. So, yeah, it changed our lives, I think. I think, you know, it all been okay before then, but I think that can put you in a different stratosphere, recognition-wise. Yeah. I'm drinking right now. <laughs> well, I, I did hear that you were all feeling a little bit worse for wear today. Is it often you get together after yeah. an hour series of Is it often you get together and, and get to hang out and, you know, and have a reunion? Well, like a happy Mondays. Happy <laughs> you know, Tuesdays. Now I was going to say, just to think about when, when we first started the whole thing, when we started Life on Mars, there was, it's one of those shows that you really don't know whether it's going to work or not, you know? And I think we were about six weeks in to filming and we started getting emails from the BBC. Only the BBC can word that will use the words like chewy. Remember that one? Something very chewy about the show. <laughs> we didn't know what, what way to take that. Courses that um, license it goes, um, and, and so it was one of those sort of processes that you, you think it's going to go one or two ways. Either we're going to die on our ass and never work again, or it's going to be something really special. Really, something really special. So, and I think there's things in it, there's the nostalgia factor of the 70s and the 80s um, that people can, and I think that was a very important element of both shows. People could, uh, you know. Go back on the journey in some respects. Yeah, so, um, I've got to bring this up, but um, you've been described as an unlikely sex symbol. I don't know if I can use it there, but this is, I'm quoting from the Sunday Times where they said that men want to be like you, women want to be with you. How does that make you feel? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Put you on the spot there. Well, I, remember, I remember there was a campaign a while back when. Um, I think it was to do with a Tory party, the Labour party. The Labour party used Gene Hunt's image with David Cameron's head and uh, as a sort of, do you really want to go back to the 80s and be this? And what, they, what, what they hadn't realised was that, you know, as that quote said, you then want to be him and you probably want to sleep with him. So I played right into Cameron's hands and I, I met him a while after and he was thrilled <laughs> to be me. <laughs> Because, I mean, but just to show that, you know, as a character, you're, you're being used within politics. I mean, that's quite influential. Yeah, it's quite worrying as well, really. <laughs> yeah, we're going to say that. Fantastic. So, now, I'm not going to hog the questions or uh, answer my own questions. I'm going to throw it out to the audience so I know we'll have a lot of questions for you. So we're just going to play a game of raise your hand. We hope we can do it the quickest. I'll get the microphone across to you. So this gentleman at the front, if you'd like to run, run around, lady with the bear is. There we go, ask your question. Hi guys, thank you for coming today. You're all fantastic. Marshall, you're my favourite. 
Uh, Marge. <laughs> it was really good to see you in fellow time travel show Doctor Who. You were great in that. I want to ask all the cast, are you fans of Doctor Who? And if so, which is your favourite Doctor? Mm. I, I think Doctor Who is considered as the going to the dark side. So, uh, in typical Chris fashion, I've been straight into the cold with these guys and I'm going to get a real kick in the car park after, after that question. Um, but that's, that's how it goes. But I don't know what the rest of them are about to, but I imagine that would be their response. Well, let's see what's their response. <laughs> let's find out. Uh, I've never seen an episode of Doctor Who. No, <laughs> <laughs> never. But the one that always stand, uh, I, that I remember is John Grigsby. Just from kind of clips on the television stuff. He was my era, I suppose. I must admit, I haven't watched much Doctor Who either. Um, I like the Sarah Jane adventures. I used to love Sarah Jane, that was good. And um, so, yeah, like Dean, I think, is where our age, I age was, or John Perkin. Yeah, I liked his car, you know, that yellow car, yeah. yeah. Nah, yeah. I told you to go down one. Well, it's a yeah. um, I've seen a few of them because I've got a lot of my old boy. Um, and he's, he's had a little Doctor Who phase. Um, it's too scary for the other two and me. Um, but no, I've, I've seen mainly David Tennant and Um Both of whom are excellent women. It's a really difficult job. Doctor Who, it's not one that I'd, I'd fancy taking on. <laughs> no more. Um, but uh, no, I think they do, they do amazingly well. Interesting comparison actually, you know, as another iconic show, if you had the choice to play, you know, to, to play a character in another of these, you know, iconic shows that are, that are here today or, or on TV at the moment, what, what one would it be? I know some of you have done a few of them already, but what would you like to prepare? Star Trek. Star Trek. Yeah. I'd like to, um, I'd like to remake The Persuaders. Yeah. And be, um, Danny Wilde and Tom Curse. But from London. Well, there was a question. You know, you know, there was a sci-fi show, wasn't there? It was a cult show. Cult TV, yeah. Uh, cult TV. <laughs> For me, I'd like to be in the Sopranos, the good show. Ah, fantastic. No, fine. <laughs> you, you didn't get a cheer for that. <laughs> Great stuff. Let's have another question. Hand up, let's go this side lady with the sort of cream coloured sleeve. Yep, yeah. keep my hand up there. What's your question? Hi guys, my question is for Philip, and it's which of the legend of Gene Genie quotes is your favourite to say? Um, well, the one that I really like, but I can't be safe because children are really into But I'll tell you later, it's kids. Come here, it's up. But uh, my, my all time favourite, I think, was Ashley's one where um, we had to break into this guy who was a sort of potential sex offender. And uh, he says to me, he says, you, you better have a warrant for my arrest, Mr. Hunt. Which I replied, you better have an arsehole the size of Gwent, my friend, because I'm your guy. I love that one. Well, two other things. Well, for some reason, it's the, it's the word Gwent. It kind of wouldn't work if it was no an arsehole the size of Lancashire or Gwent. But Gwent just, just works, you know. Brilliant. <laughs> okay, let me the pink over there. Hello, can I just say I'm actually from Gwent, so thanks for that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not No. <laughs> Do you have a question? No, it's just this thing. That was it. There's a gentleman behind you in the green shirt. Just behind you. But they're right behind you. It's a little around, that's it. Where are you going to turn? What was your question, sir? Oh, yeah. Um, I asked Dean after you before. Uh, but this is to all the cast. If you could fetch one thing back from the 70s or the 80s, 
what would it be and why? I don't know, Dean said something about blackjacks, the little swings. So it's up to all of it. A good question. What would you bring back or what would you have in mind? Massive chocolates. They all looked bigger then and they got really small now. And they were like a big size, not really. They wanted to be our hands going bigger. <laughs> oh yeah, that's it. Massive chocolates, anything else? I couldn't be bothered with a Rubik's Cube. I think that should be left in the past. Everyone just pulls the sticks off anyway and cuts it all down or smashes it on the floor and puts it back together. Rubik's Cube, and. Hair. Hair cuts from the centres. Sides, I think. So what we want to come back? Yeah, I want that to come back. <laughs> have, you, have you seen Ingleburg Hunting? Ingleburg Hunting. Think of what I'm he's representing us in Eurovision. What's he saying? He's got massive <laughs> size. He's got very big size. So size, you can bring back the size of the room. I'm going, 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 I'm we we go really, really early, about six o'clock, so we pick up. We, we get there for, for kind of seven, we'll have breakfast and makeup and things on, on set for eight, and then you work right through to seven o'clock, uh, an hour for your lunch, and you know, the location's just, it's a lot of hanging around, it's a lot of hard work. Well, the stuff in the CID is always much more, because it's sort of self-contained, and it's usually just dialogue. Drinking, so they always play heavy days, don't they? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're long days for me, six months at a time. Right, we used to like the driving stuff. I used to like the driving stuff. Well, the fun stuff was always fun, wasn't it? Guns and cars yeah. and chasers and, you know, banging up crims and the fights with the stunt guys and all that, you know. They, they were the fun days, but then when it, sometimes you see how you could get a little aggressive. And, was that real that worked in that? Yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's good. So what would you say, each of you, your favourite storyline was um, throughout the series? Favourite storyline? I think it's, I think you, I think storyline, I think it's sometimes if it relates to, we had an amazing, that we did a gay club scene. Um, if once, it relates, but, did you say? Uh, well, I think, I think, absolutely, of course. Uh, but for me, that was the, the fun, funnest day that we had on Ashes to Ashes because the dialogue just, we were in this gay club and I was going to chat with a gay guy and these were talking about bears and, 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 and all kinds of, and we just couldn't get through the day. We must have spent five hours just laughing and laughing and laughing. So it's not always a storyline that you remember as such, it's some moments that you may have had and that game, the gay club scene was. We did. Oh, you could, hang on. when the camera wasn't on somebody, you could I just remember. <laughs> Dean, I just remembered. Do you remember the snooker? Oh, the snooker. Oh, Tom, the snooker film. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. we, we were doing. We were filming in this snooker club, <laughs> and uh, we had to do a, a sort of a lineup of these sort of six or eight fellas, and they were all naked, and they were all um, cupping themselves. That is the expression. And, and for some reason, one, one of them got, got a little bit. He was obviously happy to be on set. He was. 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 My memory is having spotted it and then pointing it out to the other cast members. So on the tape, we didn't have time to sort of do anything about it, so on the tape, I'm walking along the line, and all I can hear behind me is him going. <laughs> 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 he had one line in the scene, I had a monologue. He gets to Dean's line, and the way he comes through it just. <laughs> 
I just want to know. You lived with me for a very long time. Any other? You can't talk that one. No, I think we were thrown off the set before. We were thrown off the set more than once. Keely and Dean have to be king and queen and giggling, quite frankly. They were thrown off the set one day. Was, uh, who was it being Adam? Adam James, who was, uh, in the, it was the first day, I think. And uh, we were trying to do a scene, and we had to sort of, I can't remember what the line was, but they were just, we were very naughty. Very naughty. And then we, we said, just kick them off, and we'll do it to, to go into chairs. So we just, Played the scene, I think we put two cushions with faces on <laughs> And we uh, played it to that. So, I've like, had lots of fun on the set, brilliant for that. Okay, let's get another question from the right hand side. Lady right at the back there with their hand held very, very high. Can you get a microphone across? Yep. On the end there, it's the gentleman with the red t shirt. Coming your way. Fantastic, what's your question? Uh, this is for and um, which is the best car? Which is the best car? Oh, good question. I mean, um, well, obviously, as I'm sponsored by Audi, <laughs> I think uh, they were both great. I love both the cars, but I think um, in terms of driving, I'd have to say the Porsche was more fun to drive because it was um, it was just incredibly ahead of its time as a car. You really. think this was from the early eighties? Stuff like power steering. The problem with the, with the Cortina is that when we filmed the first series of ours, it was very hot summer, it was 2005, I think. Um, and it, it just used to just literally, once the heat got to the engine, it just copped out at the time. So it was a bit of a pain. But it looked nice, but so I'd say yeah, the Quattro was, was the one. It's a German to see the fact that making cars. <laughs> Hi, um, Phil, you're one of my favourite actors. I was just thinking, uh, what, was your, host, <laughs> uh, what was your process to get start to build a character like Gene Hunt? Well, as I said earlier, brute. <laughs> I didn't really have a play. It was so well written. You know, when you've got um, a, a, a fantastic script, and the, the, the character just immediately came off the page. I remember when I first read it, um, before I'd been cast, before I'd auditioned for it, I just, I just instinctively, just, it's very rare that happens, but I just instinctively knew how to play, or how I wanted to play the character. So, um, so you know, that's, that's sort of down to the right. Um, and then I just sort of, there were a few characters from the 70s and things, uh, particularly football managers I went for, and Matt Manson and Brian Clough. I've seen them in interviews, and so I took a steel bits and pieces of that people and put that towards Gene. And then he just sort of, yeah, that happened really. Is that Marsha? Yeah. Fantastic. Question for Marsha, I mean, what, what was the turning point in Chris Gelson getting the respect from the others in the series? Um, I'm not sure really, he always seemed to sort of win, win the respect over and then do something else that, that sort of shot himself in the foot and particularly being a, you know, the traitor to him out to be the Judas at the end of it all. Um, so I don't know if he really ever fully gained, fully gained that, maybe just to be sent off by Gene to the, to the pub, finally, and he's sort of given his, his mind and said, you know, you are that sort of thing. Um, and that's probably the only time in the end that, that, that Chris got the sort of respect that maybe other people think you do. And I don't know if you do any of them, so that's it. <laughs> <laughs> was that frustrating as an actor? Does it look just respect me? You know, oh, it's, it, was, it was just good fun, you know, it was good fun to play. And, um, you know, it was, it was just one of these that's easily led and you know, just does as it's told and this, that, and the other. So. It, it wasn't frustrating in that respect. You just turn it on, you turn it off, and that's it. Really. Great stuff. And um, obviously, the relationship between between Gene and, um, and yourself, it was 
it was on one after you tried to push the modern method and you reverted back. Can you explain that relationship and how it evolved through the through the <laughs> I mean, it would, you know, they obviously got very frustrated with each other, but at the same time, there was that affection. Oh, absolutely. I think also because obviously, when you have a situation where, from an audience point of view, it's the sort of will they, won't they kind of thing, and we'd always sort of try to string it out as long as possible because we both felt that if if they ended up kissing or there was some intimacy between them too soon, then you have nowhere to go with the story. Do you know what I mean? And, you, and then effectively, you don't have a series, which is what happened with what was that series with Bruce Willis and Moonlighting. You know, as soon as they got it together, their series finished and they had nowhere to go. So I think it was just a sort of cat and mouse thing between them. And, um, and you know, Bowles was absolutely a match for Gene in every department. Well, not every department, like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, so that's what I think it was that close to the case of that. It was good fun to play. It was great. It was good fun to play. I, it, I think if it had happened, if anything had happened um, earlier on, it just would have been obvious. You know, would have sort of spoiled it. Yeah, very well played. Another question from the audience. Yeah, gentlemen with the black glove. Mm -hmm. Got a microphone. Yeah, off you go. What's your question? Um, this is a question for everyone. I thought it was interesting in the last episode to see sort of heaven, which you know, the Royal Arms Club. My question is for everyone, um, yeah, what would be your ideal version of heaven and why? What would your, your ideal version of heaven be and why? That's a deep question that was, isn't it? Peter Brown, I don't know. For me, it would be a golf course with a pub, and a probably a halfway house. Probably Augusta. <laughs> Somewhere like the Pigs Club, but with lots of drinks. So just describing our favourite place, really. <laughs> what, what, what made them choose the pub to be that place for the, you know, the, the reaching heaven or, or whatever it was? You know, who came up with that idea that it would be the pub that you took them to? It stemmed from Mother Mars, didn't it? Yeah. It stemmed from basically, the, you know, the police back then, certainly, that was where a lot of business took place in the park. That's where they met their contacts, that's where they met their grasses. So, the sort of social thing around the police force actually essential that was, was the park. That's how it came to existence, and we just thought we'd going to. I mean, of course, then by going into the 80s with Ashes, I mean, obviously, you thought, well, it would be quite fun to have a wine bar. Not for Gene, obviously, you know, the old wine bars. But um, as a representation of, of what, you know, the social scene was in the 80s, it was very much around wine bars. Can you believe it? We used to have a wine bar near our house in Pinham, run by an Argentinian, during the Falklands War. And he used to sing every night, trailers for sale all day. I don't think it lasted too long. <laughs> yeah, so. Now that's my idea of them. <laughs> Argentina. Argentina, so you can trade us for sale then. I'm good. I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> when you discovered, you through the script, whatever it was, the way in which you died, you know, when they revealed how you died, did you think, oh, it could have been more dramatic, or I wish I'd gone this way or that way? <laughs> you know, what, what were your thoughts when you read, or it was revealed as to how you died originally? I think that was really dramatic because I, I hung myself, so I, I was quite happy with that one because it, it showed a different side to the character that we'd seen for so many years. Uh, so I quite like my death. Good. <laughs> Anyone else happy with their death? I was very happy with my death because uh, I thought she was quite sort of young and had only been on the beat for a while, so for her to be killed like that, I think it's perfect. And sad. Yeah, very sad. God, this is dark. It's getting dark. <laughs> I was quite happy with my death, just got a chance to stick some blood pockets down my neck in the vault. <laughs> One of those platoon type things, I was quite happy with my death. Enjoyed it, it's brilliant. Good, good, yeah. <laughs> Another question, please. 
you get the lady there with the, the hand up in the middle, um, I don't know how to describe you. Uh, <laughs> hold it really straight, really hard. Yeah, there we go, this lady at the front here. Sort of reddish hair, sunglasses, I yeah. um, I have a question for Keely. Um, I wanted to you know what you think of Alex Drake's outfits. Yeah. Well. <laughs> um, I loved um, my wardrobe. I loved the whole process of it. We had a brilliant costume designer called Rosie Hickey, um, who was fantastic. Because you know, you do something like that, and it's it's really difficult because everybody has different memories of the eighties, you know, and, uh, and, and sort of making things suit you know, somebody. Um, something's body shape as well, you know, it's, it's all of these things are involved when you create the wardrobe for the character. So, um, we, we did have a lot of fun with it. Um, but there's also, you know, the fact that there are 15 hour days or whatever, and you're just going from scene to scene to scene, and um, it's quite difficult to, to sort of, I think people are kind of saying, oh, you know, it's, it's um, just in the first series that they, which they've been a bit, you know, more changes and actually um, we were kind of too, too busy to, to do that. So um, hopefully everybody is happy. Hopefully the girls are happy with it. How much to say do you have in the, the costume and what you want to wear you know, for your character to feel comfortable? Oh, I don't know that. It's something that's talked about with the producers, it's something that's talked about with the directors, it's something that's talked about um, you know, with, 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 it's kind of bizarre because it's it's to do with what each of us are wearing as well, colourways for the whole thing, colourways that match the set or don't match the set, or you know, it's, it's a whole thing that goes on. So um, yeah, it's really interesting. But I, um, when you get somebody like that, uh, you know, that you trust and who knows really well, you know, I think we're all we're all happy with it. I mean, I'm with your own costumes, not with mine. <laughs> And then do you find you want to wear the complete opposite when you're not on set and you're not acting, or do you kind of just slip into that role and continue to, to look like your character? Um, no, no, I, I was quite happy to do that. Yes. And you're quite often in uniform, aren't you? And obviously as Centrillion as well, is that something that attracts you to a role? That, a uniform? <laughs> I'm in a uniform role, please. <laughs> no, my Ashes uniform is so uncomfortable and hot and itchy. Oh, I hate it. Those policemen shoes. These women shoes. They're still toe capped and protected. No, they weren't. They were just nasty. Really nasty. They were still warm from the person who wore them before, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> so whenever I got out of the costume, I was very overexcited and he went for it, shares. Okay, a couple more questions and then we have to wrap it up soon. So, yeah, lady at the front here with the bracelet. Yeah, come forward. Put your hand up high again for me. Yeah. There we go, just in front of the camera. Thank you. Do you think if Jean and Alex had got together, they would have stayed together? Or they're just two different? That's a question I don't know. I don't know. What are you saying? No, I don't know. I think they would have stayed together. They would have run out gracefully. Disgracefully. Disgracefully. Yeah, yeah, I'm down the park. I don't know if they'd had kids, imagine. Oh my gosh. Sweet. Sweet. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. There's an offshoot. Children of Asia, children of G and Alex. Have there been any discussion? Is there the possibility of another answer? When the story got no better going? Because we're dead. We're dead. Everybody knows now that we're dead. It's a good point. <laughs> Looks like that's it. Any more questions? Just with the front is good to be so long, so I just <laughs> can't be dead. Get this guy at the front. Have you read any stories about John Sinn? Sure. He's not here, so you can say what you know. Any questions about John Sinn? Sinn. He went to the dark side as well as you know, and he's still laying out in the car park. <laughs> What's John? Any story? Um, no, I don't, 
he moaned more than me, probably. Which is quite a shame. I was the complete I don't know either. It's true. Oh, I've heard a bit of that. No, we, uh, it, it just... It, John had a very tough life with uh, Keely. I mean, he was in literally, in Life on Mars, in the first series, he was in every single scene. You know, it wasn't the scene that he wasn't in, because everything was seen through Sam Tyler's sort of journey and eyes. So, I think uh, he had a sort of a right to mode in a way, to be knackered by the end of it. He was doing five days in the end of say. I was doing six. <laughs> I'm not going to Change of agent. <laughs> Great question. Um, all of you obviously we know you as, as characters um, in Ashes to Ashes and some of you Life on Mars. Tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, maybe three words each to describe you as, as a person. Quick fire round, three words to describe you as a person. Starting with Colin. Three, three words. Three words. Charming. <laughs> Generous. Sexy. Oh, sexy. Sexy, sexy. Sexy, okay. Yay! Oh, Same as him. <laughs> oh, that's a compound. <laughs> it is a compound, but... Um, but yeah. I really think we don't know about you. Yeah. Any intro? There's reasons that you don't know these things about me. <laughs> um, yeah, and I can't tell you those two things. I don't really know. Um, it's a really hard question because whatever you do, and we're kind of asked it quite a lot, you know, describe yourself in five questions. And it, it always makes you feel slightly, you know, you say, oh, you know, funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. You just look like a twat. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> yes, we don't need to look like that. We don't need to look like that. Do you know what, what's probably a better question? There's just something we don't know about you then, what your interests are, whether it's cars, whether it's shopping, whether it's movies. Something we might not know. Uh, I like fly fishing. Fly fishing, okay. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a better golfer than Phil. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a really better fisherman than uh, Dean Sue. I'm Dad Keely. Exactly. Massive yeah, fish. Yeah, sea fishing. That's something you don't know about us. I had up the boat. Like fishing. Yeah, Phil yeah. caught a shark. Caught a shark. And he screamed. His name is Nigel. <laughs> That's quite an achievement. I've been told to wrap it up. I'm afraid we've got no more questions, no time for any more questions. But it's been an absolute pleasure to have you all here. You've obviously got great camaraderie and it's good fun talking to you. So keep going, Mr. Yeah.